Okay, so yeah, continuing on with uh, episode four with uh, immersive waxing, just going to quickly demonstrate how to do an immersive wax. And uh, yeah, that'll help you decide whether or not this is um, a path that's for you or not for you. Um, so step one is just removing the chain. Um, this is my cyclocross uh, race bike and gravel race bike. Um, you can see this cassette here and chain and chain rings. I have uh, scouts on it, never cleaned this at all apart from uh, post mud rides just um, washed the cassette with literally uh, tap water. Apart from that, the cassette has had zero uh, cleaning uh, and the chain comes out uh, new every time and chain rings look like that. So yeah, you, don't, you just don't have that cleaning uh, mess to deal with like you do with a lot of wet lubes. But step one, we, um, uh, with waxing, you do need to use a uh, master link or joining link. Um, need a master link tool to be able to pop the links on and off. Uh, this is a handy one that's just Squeeze one way, pops the link open, squeeze the other way, and it uh, rejoins the link. So I just get the master link. You want it in the, um, if you've got a double chain ring, you want it small chain ring and smallest cog that you can so that there's not a lot of um, chain tension. Um, if you pop the link open and you've got a lot of tension in the chain, the bottom span uh, can fling up, which is a bit exciting. So it's literally, you just put the tool on either side of the link, squeeze the link, and the link will pop open. And now my chain is ready to take off. So that's that easy. Um, now, uh, official videos by some, uh, such as Molten Speed Wax, do show to um, wax the master link uh, or the joining link. Uh, I do not wax the joining links. Uh, reason being is that when you re-wax the joining link, is that you do get wax at the base of the pin um, and also in the channels. It just makes it a lot more difficult to get the joining link back in and make sure that when you relock it that it locks into both channels. What can happen sometimes if you've got a build up of wax at the base of the pin, it doesn't allow you to push the link through uh, quite as far as you need to and you may only engage the locking channel on one side of the link which will ha then have the link fail uh, when you put power down. Um, if you're re-waxing uh, at the, I guess, the more frequent intervals which I recommend, um, there's plenty enough wax on the chain and on your link. You just don't need to worry about rewaxing the master links. So um, I'm a no uh, for rewaxing master links. So from once we pop the link off, we literally are just going to pull the chain out through our chain ring and from jockey wheels. And that's as easy as getting the chain off. We've popped the chain off the bike. Uh, the next step is just uh, to simply loop it onto what's called a chain swisher tool. Uh, this is the fancy official M Speed Wax uh, version one. You can make one uh, yourself just by bending some wire um, or a coat hanger. Um, but it's literally just a case of, I'm just looping the wire through uh, some links, just like so. They don't have to be exactly even. So we're just looping it through until it looks like that. And now it's ready to pop into a uh, wax pot. Uh, my pot, may look slightly fancier uh, than what uh, you'll need. This is a, a multi-cooker, I can set the temperature. Um, normally what you would do if you're doing your waxing is you'd pop the chain off the bike, loop it onto your swisher tool, pop it into a slow cooker, and it must be a slow cooker, which I'll explain why in a bit. Um, turn the slow cooker from off to low, go and do something fun, uh, you know, shower, eat, play around, just come back whenever later, and most times 45 minutes or so, it will be melted, uh, swish it around and hang it to set. Um, so uh, this one though, uh, if, it's, if you have pre-melted it or you've got a, a multi-cooker or instant pot that you have pre-melted um, and you put the chain in there, then you just wanna leave it in there for a good five minutes at least. Um, you need the chain to heat up to the same temperature as, as the, the nice uh, hot melted wax and for the old wax coating to melt off. And obviously when you swish it, you're then recoating it in new fresh wax. So um, yeah, if you do put the chain in uh, pre-melted wax, leave it to soak in there for at least sort of, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes uh, before you swish it and hang it to set. Uh, so now the reason why it must be um, really a slow cooker or something like a multi-cooker um, and not a common mistake is using a rice cooker. Uh, rice cookers, really blast the heat into the wax um, and it's almost kind of like a kettle and the wax doesn't like to be heated that fast. Uh, so a rice cooker will damage uh, the, the paraffin base of the wax and basically kill its uh, lubricity. Uh, and also rice cookers are a pain in the butt because once they've got to their 
100 degrees, they then cool down to 60, which is nearly the wax set point. So you, you bring a whole mess of, uh, of wa excess wax on the chain back out with you. Uh, a slow cooker on low, you just really, you can't go wrong. Uh, you can't overheat the wax with a slow cooker on low. You can forget about it, leave it overnight. You can go on holidays and go away for a week. It doesn't matter. Um, when I've done testing, I've had uh, the, the wax uh, in the slow cooker on low uh, for like an entire month of the test. It doesn't matter how, how long it's left on. If it's at a happy temperature, it's happy. So you don't, you don't need to worry. If you do um, leave it on low with the lid on or you've got it on high, uh, set a timer. Uh, how hot the wax will get in a slow cooker, um, even if it's on low with the lid on, it will depend a lot on the ambient temperature um, as well as the fill level. So if it's 30 degrees outside and you've got quite a low fill level of wax in your pot um, and you leave it on low with the lid on, it can over some hours get up to you know maybe 120 degrees, which is really getting outside its happy zone. So it's really you can you can you don't have to be pedantic. You don't need a thermometer. You don't need to do um, or be super precise. You will get a perfectly um, effective waxing anywhere really between say 70 degrees and 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, anywhere in that range is absolutely fine, and it's pretty easy to hit a 30 degree uh, range. Um, so yeah, but if you do have it on low with the lid on, if the ambient temperature is fairly warm and you leave it for a long time, it, some of the slow cookers can get up to that sort of 120 mark. If the lid is off, because the heat's escaping, it'll get up to that happy temperature. It'll never exceed that happy temperature. You just can't go wrong. You just can never sort of muck it up. So um, people do occasionally cook their wax because they try to wax in a hurry and put it on high and leave the lid on. Uh, so yeah, if you do just set a timer, and in general, waxing is not something, I guess, that you want to just sort of try to rush or do in a hurry. Um, other areas where waxing goes wrong, and I uh, just obviously, uh, to, well, to me it's obvious, but uh, to others seemingly not so, don't use your stovetop, don't use a barbecue, don't use your oven, don't use a microwave. Uh, that's where things go wrong. Um, and there are sometimes claims that, you know, uh, immersive waxing is dangerous because the paraffin's flammable. It is if, if it's exposed to an open flame. It is if you heat it up to uh, its flash point. Um, but if you have it in a slow cooker, even if you have it on high in a slow cooker and lid on, you can't uh, heat it to a point where it's going to flash ignite. So it is no more dangerous than boiling your kettle. So um, don't do uh, anything, uh, I guess, yeah, what I would call silly. So yeah, immersive waxing in your oven or your barbecue or your microwave, just not, not the way it should be. Slow cooker on low, just, you just can't go wrong. So, um, or uh, like you see here, fancy bit of a fancy one, multi cooker pot, I can set the temperature to 90, it gets to 90 uh, in a, just a nice period and stays at 90. So told you all about the what to use and we've got it on our tool. So literally uh, this one I have pre-melted, normally I, I would just pop it on with the wax uh, not yet melted and turn it on, but it's pre-melted. So literally I just pop it in my pot and as spoken about before, I'm just going to leave that for uh, a good five minutes. Now, um, at home, so you can sort of see with mine, um, uh, this is my sort of personal malt speed wax pot. It's my personal hot melt pot because I'm having fun playing with both. You can see that I've set up such a way that when I hang the chains to set, the wax is going to drip back into the pot. So bonus points if you can um, set up something similar uh, for yourself at home. It doesn't have to be uh, a double bend. You can just hang it um, singly. So uh, if you do that, then uh, it's easier sometimes if you put like a paper clip through the end uh, and you just hang, hang the paper clip on the end of a nail rather than try to get the end of a chain on something. Um, but yeah, if you can be clever enough to get it uh, such that it uh, drips back into the pot as opposed to just dripping onto the ground or a mat or something, then uh, yeah, you're getting more wax back and it's uh, cleaner and neater. So um, yeah, have fun. See if you can set up something like that wherever you're going to do the waxing. Um, this is one, this is also uh, another training chain. So this is one that uh, I've done earlier. Uh, it's set. Uh, you'll see that it's quite stiff. So normally um, with a chain, once it's been freshly waxed, you won't be able to just install it straight away onto your drivetrain. Um, you need to break what's called the wax bond of the links. So you can do them link by link. Um, it's, it's not a bad temperature in the, in the workshop here, so it's fairly easy to do. In, in cold attempts, it can be quite quite, quite a, a bit of work. So doing it link by link can get a little bit old. If you've got something that you can, once you've done the first few, 
If you can move it through to something where you can just pull the chain around, it can be a piece of dowel, nylon or plastic, and I literally can just pull that through and that breaks the wax bond on the links. And now I've got a nice malleable, freshly waxed chain ready to reinstall back onto the bike, ready to ride. So um, quite personally, I often, when I do my waxing, uh, once I've popped the chain off, pot, put it on the pot and turn the pot on, I just go away, do something fun, come back whenever later, swish it and hang it to set. And then I literally, I'll, I'll do this part uh, just before I, I go for a ride. So it's like I just uh, I allow like a minute and a half, two minutes uh, of time, that's all I need to break the wax bond and pop the chain back on. Okay, so the chain's been uh, soaking in the wax for uh, at least five minutes. So the, the chain uh, will be the same temperature as the wax now. The old coating will be uh, melted off and I just want to give it a good solid swishing inside the wax uh, just to get it recoated with a whole fresh coating of wax. So just swish it around for a good sort of 10 odd seconds, giving it a good swish. And then once that's done, now we can just pull the chain out of the wax pot. Just let the initial excess uh, just drip back in there. You can see, so this chain's actually looking a little bit old because this is, as we saw with the, um, uh, or we would have seen with check measure, this is really on its replacement mark. Uh, so you can see some of the gold's worn went off the chain. This one's uh, had, a, had a pretty good time. Um, you may also notice this one actually has some black links in the gold because I added some oversized pulley wheels, so I added some extra links in. But yeah, we're just uh, letting the chain drip, uh, excess drip off. But every time your chain comes out of the pot, it will again look pretty new. So you don't like without any cleaning whatsoever, chain comes out of the pot, it's going to look nice and clean uh, every single time, and it's it's reset back to a great place. And so now I'm just looping it over where I'm hanging this particular one to set. So I'm just unlooping it from my swisher tool. You'll notice I'm wearing uh, gloves so I don't get hot wax on my fingers. Um, and then I just leave that until uh, that'll set. And then I just uh, break the wax bond uh, as we showed. And, uh, and the next part we'll be showing you how we reinstall the, uh, the wax chain back onto the bike. Okay, so I've got a, a freshly waxed uh, chain uh, to put back on. So the other one's still hanging to set, but uh, race weekend this weekend anyway. So putting my dedicated uh, race chain uh, on the bike. So uh, I've chosen this bike uh, because this is, um, if anything, it's one of the going to be one of the harder um, uh, putting chain back on scenarios uh, for waxing that you get. If you've got a road bike and so on, it's much, much easier. So I've picked a tricky one just to show you how uh, even a tricky one is nice and super easy. So I've got my freshly waxed chain and literally all I need to do is I start at the top. Now the reason why this one is sort of trickier than what a road bike will be is because um, being a cyclocross gravel bike, I've got a narrow wide chain ring uh, on here. So I need the, the wider uh, teeth uh, to go in the outer link and the narrower teeth to go on the inner link. So I've just got to make sure that that is happening there as I thread that through the chain guide. On a road bike, obviously you don't have narrow wide uh, tooth profiles on your chain ring, so that's not something that you need to worry about. Once I've threaded it through uh, at the front, it's literally just a matter of, of putting the chain back, uh, running through the uh, derailleur, uh, exactly how uh, it, it came off. So I'm just going to run it around. And again, you want to do this in the small chain ring and small cog. Um, so your chain is going to go back into there. It's going to go onto your jockey wheel. Now you'll be pretty well used to the fact that it's going to run around that jockey wheel and then around your cassette. Within every derailleur cage, there is what's called a guide tab. So it's a, it's a tab that's going to be in your cage and the chain is going to need to run inside that tab because if it goes on the outside of it what would happen is the chain is going to be rubbing against that tab as it runs over this wheel so we'll try to get a close-up of that maybe after but basically every derailleur cage will have a guide tab and it needs to go on the uh, the guide wheel side of that tab so your upper jockey wheel is called the guide wheel so I go inside the tab I go around the wheel now this one is also a bit tricky because it's a uh, I got a, a clutch derailleur on it. If I sort of try to push that down, it's a fair bit of force. 
So this one, I'll need to turn the clutch off. Again, road derailers, you're not going to need to worry about that. If you have a SRAM uh, derailleur, you move that forward and it has a locking pin. So that's how you sort of just get past the clutch. But if you've got a SRAM derailleur um, and you're not sure, just Google that and you'll become familiar with what to do with your SRAM derailleur. And so literally I'm just threading it back through. Uh, make sure that's running around there. And so now it's just a matter of connecting up the two ends of the chain with my connect link again. So I grab my uh, master link that I had before and I'm just gonna pull the bottom uh, span so that I've got the chain ready. So I'm gonna put the link, one's gonna go in one side, the other is going to go in the other side so that I've got a pin to go into a locking channel on each side of the chain. I'm going to pull that together and I'm going to line up the pins with the locking channel and then get it set. So once, once I've got that sort of set um, and you get, you get to know that by feel uh, pretty quickly. Once you've done it a couple of times, getting that, that initial set is very easy. If you find that, that it is difficult, so I'll just re-pop that open. If you're finding that it's difficult to get that because you're sort of fighting against the, the, the spring of the derailleur, a bit of a cheat is just to pop the chain off the ring a little bit so that you don't have to fight much tension um, so that you can get really easy feel of getting that pin into the locking channel and just get it set and then you can pop your chain back to where it should be on the ring. Um, but most times you'll find, especially with road derailers that don't have as much uh, spring tension, it's, it's very easy to get that rejoined. Once you've got that master link so the, the pin is ready to go to get locked back into the uh, locking channel, take your master link tool. This time, instead of the squeezing open part, I'm going to use the squeeze apart to lock it section. Again, it just goes on either side of the link into the inner links there. I squeeze it and it just snicks into that uh, locking channel. Um, and that's done. So it's something that the first time you do it, it might take you, um, you know, maybe five minutes um, and maybe you have a couple of goes at it. Once you've done it a few times, it, you just get like, it's super easy. You get so, I guess, efficient at popping chain off, sticking on a tool, putting it in your wax pot. That's like one minute labor time maximum. You go away, you do something fun, come back sometime later, swish it and hang it to set, it's 30 seconds later time. Allow yourself, say, maybe two minutes uh, to break the wax bond and reinstall the chain. You're looking at a total of about three and a half minutes of actual physical labor time to do a re-wax um, and, and that's it. Uh, so, and again, for that, you don't have to do any drive tra train or, uh, or chain cleaning. Your chain will just come out magnificent every time, especially if you're just doing road and dry gravel and, and not heavy in the mud. Um, <clears throat> once the chain's on, just pedal it in a bit. Uh, you can get some extra wax just um, that will, will come off when it's been first re-waxed. Um, and especially though, if it's outside, that will just uh, uh, basically blow away. The chain will be a little bit stiff for the first few minutes. So um, if you do have a race, uh, you don't race on a like straight out of the pot uh, chain. Don't start your criterion with that. Um, break the chain in. So if it's a race, you'll want to have broken the chain in by a good sort of 20 minutes of riding. Uh, if it's just your normal training ride, you will notice the chain is a little bit stiff for a few minutes. It's a little bit stiff to change gears for a few minutes and then it will be all freed up, broken in and you won't notice it uh, while you're riding. And, uh, but for racing purposes, after about 20 to 30 minutes is when it's in its absolute sort of optimal zone. So uh, race chains will have a, a pre uh, break in. I have a set ergo I do uh, pre uh, each race day, which I do on my race chain and breaks it in uh, to a perfect spot. So I can do something like that. But overall, that is basically, um, yeah, popping your chain on and off and doing an immersive rewax. It really is uh, a lot easier than I think what most people think it might be. Um, and if you haven't taken a chain on and off before, uh, honestly, literally it's just one of those things that once you've done it your first two or three times, you will wonder what you are worried about uh, to start with. So yeah, it's uh, super easy. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, uh, thanks for watching and don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the channel and other YouTube type things like share with your friends. Uh, so 
that will keep you up to date with the latest low friction news and hints and tips. And um, yeah, also put any comments down below and I can uh, try to look at those and uh, take them into account for future episodes. 